Good afternoon everybody. I'm Mary Corloff, the President of the Royal Society of Tasmania and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar. We're very pleased that so many members and supporters have been able to join us. In beginning this webinar, I pay respect to the traditional and original owners of the land upon which we meet today, the Muanina people, to pay respect to those that have passed before us and to acknowledge today's Tasmanian Aboriginal community who are the custodians of this land. This is a special lecture today for the Royal Society of Tasmania as it is a Clive Lord Medal Lecture. And if you're not sure who Clive Lord was, I recommend Googling his name and you'll be astounded that some one person fitted so much into his life. The Clive Lord Medal is awarded every three years to a scholar who has distinguished themselves for research into either Tasmanian science or Tasmanian history. Usually the awards alternate. The award was established in 1930. And today we congratulate Professor Jamie Kirkpatrick AM on winning the Clive Lord Medal in 2019. A couple of things about this webinar. Your Zoom chat facility is turned off. You will be able to ask questions at the end of the lecture by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing your questions in. You can type those in at any time during the lecture if something occurs to you. And at the end of the lecture, I'll read out a selection of those questions which Jamie is happy to answer. This lecture is being recorded and it will be placed on our Royal Society of Tasmania's YouTube channel. There's a link to that from our Royal Society of Tasmania website and attendees will be sent the link tomorrow also. Our speaker today, Jamie Kirkpatrick, is a distinguished professor in geography and environmental studies at the University of Tasmania, where he helps students learn about nature, researches its characteristics and conservation, and engages with wider society. Professor Kirkpatrick has supervised to graduation more than 70 higher degree students. He is most cited in the academic literature for his work on planning conservation reserves and on the socio-ecology of urban areas. He has also written or contributed to many publications that are accessible to a wider audience. These include several books with Peter Dombrowskis and most recently Art by Nature. And I also need to mention that Professor Kirkpatrick is a very prolific contributor to our Royal Society Papers and Proceedings, which is an annual publication of scholarly refereed articles. So if you haven't yet checked this out, please do. It's been digitised and previous issues and articles are available from, for download from a link through our website. And of course, we encourage all scholars, especially those with an interest in Tasmanian characteristics, science, history, etc., to publish in our journal. Now, Jamie could have written on, could, could have spoken on many topics today, but for today's talk, he has chosen the topic cyclic dynamics in Tasmanian high mountain treeless vegetation. So I now pass the screen over to you, Jamie. Thank you. Hello everyone, there's um, I can't screen sharing. Mary, I can't seem to. Um, you need to move on to your next slide, Jamie, either by using the down arrow or the, the side arrow. Yes, it's not behaving itself. <laughs> oh dear. Maybe I, it's just not doing it. Ah, it is doing it now. That's great. That's great. I apologise. It's um, artificial unintelligence. Um, doesn't like me very much a, a lot of the time and uh, does tend to do that sort of thing. I'm talking about cyclic dynamics in Tasmanian high mountain treeless vegetation, which is one of some of the most wonderful vegetation in the world, I'm sure, though I might be slightly prejudiced. It's, um, it, 
Tasmanian high country is a place of rare distinction and um, rare deviance from the norm for alpine, alpine vegetation. The alpine and subalpine areas of Australia are pretty restricted, you know, less than 2% of the continent, uh, but are, are very distinctive. The Tasmanian alpine areas, which are scattered as an archipelago around the, the central plateau region, uh, constitute the larger part of the area of high mountain country in Australia, but the Australian stuff equally is wonderful, but not quite as distinctive as Tasmania, because the thing about Tasmanian alpine country is that we live in a highly maritime environment. On the mainland, it gets very cold in winter and very warm in summer. In Tasmania, we're constantly having westerly and southwesterly winds, lowering our temperature um, or increasing our temperature depending on uh, whether it's winter or summer. So snow is actually a rarity in the Tasmanian high country in compared to most high country in the world. And this has a lot of implications. One of the implications is that the um, plants are exposed to pretty extreme conditions. Uh, it's very nice and cozy and warm under snow, but uh, on the, if you're exposed to the elements, you've got bits of ice and bits of gravel coming at great velocities, like it was 134 kilometers an hour on the top of Mount Wellington last week, um, and hitting the plants. And of course, they're exposed to long wave radiation loss, so they, it gets very cold. Even though the Tasmanian mountains aren't very cold, it does get very cold, minus 24 grass temperatures and below grass temperatures can be pretty severe and it can freeze on the surface, though it never freezes to depth. Um, it's warm enough not to freeze to depth, but it's cold enough on those cold nights to just freeze on the surface. And we have mammals, we have little wombats like woolly mammoths walking across the landscape and hiding in the block streams and munching on the vegetation. We have Bennett's wallabies uh, also munching on the vegetation. On mainland Australia, the larger marsupials don't get into the alpine zone, here they do. Elsewhere in the world, the animals go up and down the mountains, here they don't. So we have a really distinctive uh, type of vegetation and ecosystems. Um, even our mountain shapes are, are pretty weird, like a lot of our mountains are flat because the dolerite sill or because they're sedimentary beds like the boomerang in the top left hand there. And uh, <clears throat> so that's pretty unusual globally. They're not, not totally unusual, but um, it is uh, quite distinctive. We do have some uh, mountains that are suitably snaggletoothed in places in Tasmania, like these western mountains, the eastern Arthurs here in the Denison Ranges, which got burnt over last year a little bit. Um, they're quartzite and quartzitic con conglomerate, but they're very unusual, even though they've been chewed by glaciers, so they, they look almost archetypal mountains. They're really unusual. They're composed of a very hard material that breaks down very slowly and releases virtually no nutrients into the environment. So they're amazingly nutrient challenged uh, environments, the Western mountains of Tasmania. So we have these flat mountains in the east, flat plateau like mountains in the east, and we have these uh, precipitous snaggle toothed quartzite mountains in the west and a scattering of, um, of sedimentary mountains in the middle. And we have enormous rainfall, particularly in the west. Uh, measured in metres, nothing like New Zealand, but South Island, New Zealand, but nevertheless, uh, metres are a, a, suitable, a suitable measuring unit. <clears throat> the Tasmania, given this uh, really unusual environment, the Tasmanian Alpine area is, um, is very, very distinct biologically. It's um, uh, as Greg Jordan has shown, it's um, chocolate block full on its boundary with the lower vegetation uh, with, with paleoendemic species that have been around at least 60 million years since the Cretaceous. And it, it has some pretty weird vegetation types for alpine areas. Anyone that's been in Europe or North America or New Zealand will expect alpine areas to have grasses and herbs and a lot of bare ground. 
and snow, they're going to be sorely disappointed if that's what they want in Tasmania because the things we have here are, are quite distinct to most other places in the world, like cushion plants like Dracophila minimum here, which is a shrub, bizarrely happens to be a shrub. And these heathlands, alpine heathlands with dwarf eucalypts and the famous um, scaparia, which scratcheth mightily anyone who dares to come into its domain. And these sedge lands, which aren't really talked about very much, this is Isophysis tasmanica, which has got a black flower, which isn't very apparent in this particular photograph. Um, it's a monocot, um, a resonance monocot that spreads over the landscape and absolutely beautiful. On the aerial photographs, it looks golden, golden. Now, I'm talking about cyclic, um, cyclic phenomena in, um, in, these high, in this high country. And I, I labeled it high mountain because, uh, because the, a lot of these features occur below the climatic tree line, but in treeless vegetation. Now this is work that Nick Fitzgerald and I published a couple of years ago that's actually looked at wind data for Tasmania. Why do I want to look at wind data? Because wind is one of the forces that you get uh, working really, really hard to move and mould soils and create cyclic succession in, uh, in environments where snow doesn't hang around. So you can see in the top right hand uh, picture there, a Tariga pappus, one of the cushion plants, another one of the cushion plants, being pushed across the landscape, eaten away on one side and growing on the other side. And you can see the wind distortion in the bottom right hand, um, bottom right hand picture. Um, and um, you have a series of graphs, which you probably don't have time to digest, but the storyline is that the winds, the strong winds and the winds in general generally come from the west. But the lean on the plants, the retreat on the plants is either from the southwest or from the northwest. On the drier mountains, the plants will lean away from the fierce northwesterly winds of summer, which um, are created by high pressure systems on the mainland and the dragging of hot air over Bass Strait and over Tasmania. So on top of Mount Wellington, which that bottom photograph shows, the plants lean away from the northwest, but on most of the mountains they lean away from the southwest and the southwesterly winds and tend to be the ones that follow fronts that come through in the winter and uh, very strong winds over 100 kilometers an hour is just usual. You know, it's not a rare event in the Tasmanian mountains and um, they pick up a bit of gravel, a bit of ice and, and a braid and push the plants away and they can push them across landscapes. So this is on um, a mountain that's very rom unromantically named as Hill One. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, surveyors weren't on their best metal at those days though. They, they lost all their biblical illusions that, uh, that litter Tasmania. But, and this just looks like a bad case of erosion perhaps caused by a camp spot or, or too much trampling. But it's, it seems to be, it might be a cyclic phenomenon because that's, um, that erosion area is pointing to the southwest. And at the top of that erosion area, the fine particles that have been eroded from the bottom of the erosion area are being pushed up. Um, so the winds are carrying the material up. So all over Hill One, you can see evidence of past, of past these past erosion uh, areas that have filled up again and been revegetated in somewhat of a cyclic cyclic manner. Uh, but that's sheer speculation because we haven't got a long temporal series. It's just uh, just so story from looking at uh, the morphology. We do have some slightly better stories of that wind pushing. Chris Harwood and I in the late 70s um, had a rather interesting walk into the Boomerang and uh, Mount Bobs and, um, and 
on the boomerang, which is a highly, uh, highly, highly fissile, composed of highly fissile mudstone, we found all these plants that were seemed to be being pushed by the wind. And we were very excited because we'd read the paper on the migrating fell marks from Kosciuszko and our own migrating fell marks. Of course, we didn't have much evidence that it was happening, but a student of mine, Stella Thomas, went up there um, with Nick Fitzgerald, who's, who's a, another colleague and student that I've worked with. Um, and they went for a day trip to um, the boomerang, which is a bit shocking, really, from my point of view. <laughs> if anyone could do that. But, um, and got some almost repeat photographs. And between 1979 and uh, 2015, you can see those things are moving. But what, what else you can see is that the vegetation has got a bit taller and thicker, not that it's very thick. Um, so the progress of uh, this Podocarpus Lorenzii over the landscape um, is a bit of a race with climatic change, one would think. <clears throat> then when I first started um, going, going to play, the boomerang was my first introduction to these mudstone mountains and I uh, went on a trip with Tony Moskal who was a uh, an escapee from the Romanian submarine force during the Second World War who looked at some um, who got obsessed with Tasmanian um, endemic plants and we decided we'd go to Rocky Hill and uh, Pyramid Mountain. I can't remember the reason why but um, we did and it was a pretty monumental walk to get there. He used to follow Tony, he'd, he'd be constantly smoking black cigarettes and there'd be this line of smoke, so you'd never lose him. And we found this, uh, this feature, these are non-sorted stone steps and stripes, um, we later found out um, in the fissile mudstone. As you go over a slope of eight degrees, they get steeper and steeper. And looking at them, we were able to see that um, they, they weren't fossil features, they were features that were still, still seem to be still seem to be active because there was stone sitting on the top of vegetation which indicates something and uh, there was wind there was fine particles being moved uphill and uh, there were little runnels in the in the uh, in the unvegetated stuff which was full of roots so a lot of it was full of roots so the latest student brian annandale actually sat up in one of these things overnight and um, <clears throat> to test the hypothesis that they were active features. And uh, indeed, <laughs> they, yes, the, the rather unromantic pen is being lifted, lifted up and down by needle ice. Um, and the needle ice lifts up the larger particles, which um, <clears throat> move downhill and then get trapped by the vegetation. So, but you don't get the needle ice. You, this is a, an example of trapping, evidence of trapping. Um, but you don't get the needle ice under vegetation. So you end up getting everything sorted out into stripes and into rises, as they're called, where they go upwards, and treads where they're flat and the treads are exposed to the atmosphere. So you get this, uh, this fantastic effect of, uh, of needle ice uh, lifting, the, lifting the particles and the bigger ones move further downhill, presumably get trapped. Um, so yeah, they're really, really interesting features and I'll return to them towards the end of this talk because um, uh, we did some long, long time sequences on some of them to see what was happening with them. Uh, and I'll return to that. I think the most exciting cyclic dynamics that um, that I've worked on was with Sam Morgan and Mike Britt DeFalco and Jenny Winham helped a little bit in this in the early days. What happened, I was flying because I used to go on like planes a lot um, to get to places and they're fantastic. They're almost as good as walking and looking in the landscape. And I was looking down over the Traveller range and I, I saw these features like, uh, a giant had scraped their fingernails over the landscape from the southwest to the northeast. And I thought to myself, oh, this must be some sort of glacial feature perhaps. But they were striking from the air, the yellow and brown stripes um, 
in the landscape, sort of tiger stripes. And Jenny and I went up there to have a look at them and poked them with, um, with metal sticks to see if it was the underlying topography. Didn't seem to be. Um, went away very much bewildered. And then Sam Morgan, who's now a vet in Northwest Tasmania, he, uh, for his honest thesis, he, you know, I suggested that Gompi might try to work out what they were, because I knew it was very bright. And um, he, um, he did a, a really amazing, amazing job on it. Um, so the area he worked on as shown on this map is that boot, there's a boot there. And the striped bit of the boot is the striped bogs and the rest of it's just normal sort of everyday sphagnum bog covered by Richia, Richia scoparia. And this is what it looks like on an aerial photograph. And you can see the strings there. This is a black and white photograph because academic journals are very boring. And, and most of them, though the Royal Society Journal is an exception, is wonderful from the, for that because it will publish, um, publish coloured material, which really makes a difference um, in understanding things and depicting things. So you can see the string orientation is southwest to northeast, but the slope is north to south. So the strings proved, and that's what it looks like on the ground. Um, so this is in the subalpine zone and even perhaps in the montane zone, because those big trees in the background are Eucalyptus deligatensis. And um, you, can see, you can see the stripes in this. And closer up, you can see a good picture of our tape. This is looking from the um, southeast to the northwest. And we're looking at a massive sphagnum moss with um, lots of um, Bolosky and Astral in it. Um, and we can't really see the darker stripes because they're behind those, behind those ridges. Um, but behind those ridges, they're lieth uh, Richia scoparia is the species behind the ridges and it's facing northwest. So yes, northwest, where do those dry strong winds come from for the northwest? Where do those cold, um, cold scouring winds come from the southwest? So we started to think that maybe these were wind created phenomena. Maybe the wind was um, was <clears throat> pushing these things a little bit, um, you know, eating eating away the sphagnum from the northwest with the hot winds, and allowing the scoparia to invade. And um, maybe the southwest northeast um, um, orientation of these things that they'd been trained by the winds. So we put out a whole lot of anemometers um, and looked at the wind speeds from various directions in various synoptic situations. And we also just measured the orientation of these things. So what this graph shows that um, independent of the aspect of the slope, um, the, uh, the orientation of the lineations is between 50 and 50 and 90, most of, almost all of them between 50 and 90. So we, the slope was, these lineations were independent of the slope. So they weren't anything to do with glaciation at all. The, the underlying topography was really much, was really independent of the, uh, of the stripes, totally independent of the stripes. But we managed to discover that the stripes were moving. So this diagram here shows you sphagnums, the light colored stuff, Restionaceous peat, Bolosky and Astral, which is the you know, sort of rope rushes type stuff. Um, and sphagnum peat, slightly darker light stuff. And it was striped. I, remember, I clearly remember it was one of the great moments of my life and Sam and my Brit putting out the core on the table in our lab downstairs. And it comes out with these beautiful stripes, which basically tell you that the, um, the ridges are moving. <laughs> There's a replacement of ridge by swale, ridge by swale, ridge by swale through time. And we managed to work out that was over about three to 400 years that took place. We did put out some pins, but nothing happened over four months. 
So that was a wind related phenomenon, really unusual. I still haven't come across anything else that's like it in the world though. On a, on a cover of um, Austral Ecology was an article by Kath Dickinson and others from New Zealand, which I'm sure had um, striped these stripe bogs on it. I could see them in this cover, but no one's ever followed it up in New Zealand. And it wasn't only stripe bogs, but also pools. Now pools are really ecologically important in the high country because the, um, uh, they, provide an environment for species that don't occur elsewhere, but, and they're, they're vernal pools. These pools are vernal pools. So we're on the central plateau of the Tasmania, still near, near Lake Ada. And if you wander across the very flat landscape, which I, I love, you, um, you come across these little shoals of pools. They're the white, the white um, shard-like things that you can see in this um, high resolution aerial photograph. And they're all orientated, well, not all of them, if they're in large sphagnum bogs, they're not, but most of them are orientated um, southwest, northeast, and a few of them are orientated northwest, southeast. So they're important biologically, and they're also a very interesting uh, phenomenon. So these things fill with water, ice, and snow um, during the winter. So this is Violet Harrison Day's photograph of them in the middle of the winter. We've taken to going up in the winter recently into alpine areas because some exciting things happen even though it's extremely cold, but that's a beautiful day as you can see. Um, um, yeah, unfortunately they close all the gates so you have to ride bicycles in about 20 kilometers to get to this stuff. So, um, and that's what they look like in the summer. You can see the vegetation is very different. So what we're doing here is setting up sediment traps to see, see if the if the um, if these um, these vernal pools move, um, and the sediment traps. We did get a bit more sediment on the um, the downwind ones than we got on the others. Um, these we put out sticky traps, so we could just work out how much sediment was blowing through the air. But it really, really puzzled us that um, a lot of these things are quite well vegetated and where they're not well vegetated, they have an algal scum which holds the soil together. So where was this sediment coming from? And that was the virtue of actually going up in uh, wintry conditions because we found out uh, this is needle ice, uh, which very effectively disrupts the cryptogam sort of um, mat that forms on the, 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 uh, the bottom of these, these little water features. And also very effectively uproots anything with the temerity to try and establish that that hasn't got a, a spreading habit. So, so, so we think, but though we're not certain, we're not certain about anything really, but we think that um, the orientation of these, these features, these vernal pools, is a, is a product of deflation, deflation and movement uh, in the direction of, direction of the wind. Um, so they were features that were wind, wind wrought features. They're not the only, not the only features that we get in, um, the high country that are of interest in terms of cyclic succession. Now, these landforms that I've talked about, <clears throat> one phase replaces another phase, you know, like grasslands are replaced by pool as it moves across the landscape. Um, uh, ridge is replaced by swale as it moves across the landscape. Um, the cushion plants and podocarpus replace gravel and then go on to be replaced by gravel as they move across the landscape. Um, but in fully vegetated areas, we may have um, some, we have some evidence of cyclic succession. This is in the same country on the central plateau around, you know, near Lake Ada and Augusta. And um, <clears throat> the dark, um, the dark hummocky things you can see in this, this photograph are Empidisma minus, which is one of about six names it has had since I moved to Tasmania in 1972, and may not be the correct one even. I, I may have been, I may be out of date. 
And this species forms these circles in this native grassland dominated by tussock grass power. And uh, when we first saw them on the aerial photograph, well, when I first saw them on the aerial photographs, because um, uh, I wondered what they were. I mean, like you can see that you see away from the coloured stuff, you can see grey, grey to black circles all over the landscape, and the coloured stuff are circles as well. But uh, what we've done with those is to to measure. Uh, measure the speed, measure the, their growth through time, because we had aerial photographs in 1953, 1990, and 2011. So 1953 is how big they were. The green stuff is how big they were then, and then the blue stuff in 1990 is how big they were then, and in 2011, orange, the orange ones are how big they were then. But the interesting thing is, if you look at this photograph, is that you get the impression that the larger circles are more faded than the smaller circles. And there's some intimation of that in our data as well. So as the, as the circles get bigger, they start to fade. And one of the first things we investigated was, well, what are the circles? And they seem to be individual plants of Empathisma minus, the rope rush that just expand out in a circle and in fact it's more of an ellipse because they actually do get pushed by the wind so they tend to tend to be orientated um, they're more elongated in the southwest northeast axis than they are in the northwest southeast axis so they're not quite circles but yeah so there was data we so we measured the reflectance of the circles at the different times and the bigger circles did show some tendency to be to fade so we may have an example of cyclic succession, but if we do, it's been disrupted somewhat because you can see that the general tendency is for empedisma to increase in the landscape, the circles to increase in the landscape at the moment, because the central plateau has been through the ringer a bit. Um, it um, was heavy, very heavily transhumantly grazed by sheep. Um, it was burned um, to bring up green pick for sheep. Then the sheep were taken off when it became World Heritage Area um, and the burning stopped. Um, and uh, so there may have been a whole lot of release stuff going on there. And climate change has hit hardest in Tasmania on the central plateau of Tasmania. It's one of the places that's been most affected by climate change with very localised droughts and very localised uh, heavy rainfall events. and extreme temperatures. I noticed Liawini had, had the lowest temperature recorded in Tasmania about two weeks ago. Um, so so it's um, if it is a cyclic phenomenon, it, it may be being perverted by the uh, its, um, its disturbance history at the moment. But it would be a very nice story if it was, um, though we can't, can't say anything like that for certain. And here's another story at a different scale. This again is in the same area on the central plateau, which has been a great source of fascination um, with, uh, with a, yet another one of my colleagues and students. I worked with so many wonderful people over the years um, in the Alpine, Alpine areas and elsewhere that I, I feel very pr privileged. If you look at the photograph down below, I've used my meager skills to accentuate um, those rings. And what we're talking about here is Richia acarosa, which is a very prickly reddish shrub, alpine shrub, but it's endemic to Tasmania. And it's um, fire sensitive, it's killed by fire as an individual. Um, and uh, which like most of the shrubs in the Tasmanian alpine zone are very fire sensitive. But what you can see in this, um, this manipulated photograph is a whole lot of, of circles. Um, and I haven't drawn them, they just, they're in the landscape. <laughs> no, they're in the landscape. And a lot of those circles have little beads or dots on them. Yeah, you can see the little beads or dots around the circles there. The, the sticks that are standing up there are, are um, uh, an experimental plot that Jenny Winham and others and I put in 
to, to look at the effects of, um, of uh, riding horses, of horse poo on the landscape. And uh, we've been utilizing ever since to understand the dynamics of the vegetation. Yeah, circles with uh, neck laces with, um, you know, circular neck, what neck laces abound in that particular landscape. Um, pictures up above were, were the, um, the mapping of these um, that were, took place um, 13 years before this article was published. So um, <clears throat> the Daniel Farmery, um, who is now MacPhail, um, mapped every individual plant in 13 plots. And I went up 13 years later and remapped them to see what had, see what had happened, which was... Um, and what seems to happen is, is that you've got this, um, this <clears throat> sequence of small to large to senescent, and that changes the microclimate. We put a lot of measurement equipment up there and the microclimate changes. And in the middle of the oldest uh, shrubs, which are senescing, and they senesce in the middle and they spread out in a circle. Um, my computer's just playing up again. I'll see if I can go the other way. What's going on? I might be because I'm in the wrong place. Yeah, I am. Yep. I shouldn't have, yeah, I was in the wrong place. But that's what it looks like. So the cyclic succession here is from, from shrub to back to the, the herb-rich grassland. But while the plants are doing this, spreading out, they seem to provide a really good environment for the establishment of their own seedlings. So you get seedlings in a circle around the outer ring, rim of the plant. So you've got an incipient new circles forming in circles, which should should make for some very interesting geometric patterns given a, a long enough time for it to happen. But the interesting the interesting thing about this is, and there's a graph here which um, shows senescence, that proportion of the rich Iracarosa that's dead. Um, percentage of it that's dead uh, against the um, against whether it's grazed or ungrazed, whether it's inside this exclosure, which has been there now for several decades, a couple of decades at least. And um, <clears throat> so the grazed, uh, the grazed areas, there's a lot of senescence, which is not surprising. The whole landscape is full of wombats and wallabies and there. And, occasional fishermen and they're, they're basically galloping around, breaking off branches and, and otherwise causing, causing damage to the landscape. Um, whereas in the exclosure, they're nice and safe in the exclosure, but it took a long while, but uh, the exclosure had the effect of having grass starting to grow reasonably tall. And um, yeah, that grass seems to have cut off the regeneration of Richia acarosa which was fascinating. So that means if you look at the graph, you can see hardly any black dots uh, below 0.2. They're all white dots. So they're all outside rather than inside. <clears throat> so it looks like the perpetuation of the cyclic succession depends on heavy grazing pressure from the native animals, which is a, a, fascinating, a fascinating outcome of this uh, of this particular study. Of course, the classic study that I've been engaged in since 1983, um, when I first started collecting this data with, um, with Neil Gibson, who's now in Western Australia. Um, he was been a long time doing really good work in Western Australia, but he still loves the Alpine stuff. And every five years or so, he comes back and we go out together and we photograph a, a series of plots that we put in. But this is the model of the that we we proposed in our original paper of what actually happens with the in the cyclic succession of these ponds. Um, so you've got a block stream, you've got cushion plants establishing, or maybe sedges start off with, and they basically spread the water and create a pond which spreads. Uh, their dams grow up um, as a result of the water that's held behind them. Uh, then the peat starts 
become go from fire brick, fiber rich, to sap brick, which is just mud pie. And the weight of the water pushes a hole through and they drain and then they revegetate. That was our theory. And like most theory, un unlike most theories that I've that I've been involved in promulgating, it actually appears as if it might be true. <laughs> which is a bit of a turn up for the books. Um, so this is uh, one that had just broken through um, when we started working up there, uh, this particular this particular one. And you can see what happens is there's not enough rainfall for, um, for <clears throat> to support, um, support cushion plants. Um, they have to have water flowing, water coming across the surface. So the cushion plants die out, the, uh, dwarf pines um, have a picnic. Uh, the peat starts to oxidize. And if you look in the background, you can see the revegetation process from virtually nil is starting in the background of this photograph here. So um, yes, it is a cyclic succession. And we think from a carbon date that an article that Neil Gibson and I wrote in 1992, which you didn't believe at the time, um, we think it's probably correct. It's probably a 700 year to 900 year <laughs> cycle, um, fast as everything is in the Alpine zone. And um, yeah, but it does appear that it could be a cyclic, cyclic succession. The evidence does fit, so far does fit that, uh, that model. <clears throat> now, I'm finishing off talking about snow um, and uh, <clears throat> the changes in climate that have taken place in Western Tasmania. Because all these cyclic successional phenomena are obviously tied in closely with the alpine climate and its implication for animals, its implication for winds. So what's been happening? Um, these are, these are satellite images that show the distribution of snow as that beautiful bright blue color at a particular time as Landsat's gone over Tasmania where snow is. And I looked at a huge number of these from about 1983 onwards to try and work out changes in incidence of snow um, through time since the early 80s um, in Tasmania. And um, yeah. So the diagram on the right shows the results of this. Um, there's, um, and this is for Mount Field. So Mount Field on, on Mount Field, the incidence of snow, um, clear days with snow between April and December, the percentage of clear days with snow between April and December. And it appears to be cyclic and it fits in with some of the you know, Indian Ocean bipole and all that sort of stuff sort of stuff, cyclic stuff a little bit. Um, so I'm reasonably happy it hasn't changed all that much since 1983 in terms of incidence. That doesn't mean it mightn't have changed in terms of uh, snow, uh, uh, snow depth, it could have. Um, and yet when I looked at a whole lot of other mountains, the lower mountains were losing snow, the lower elevation mountains were losing snow. And I was just totally puzzled about all this until I ran into Manuel Nunes in the corridor and explained it to him, you know, what's, what's happening, why we still got snow and, you know, is snow persisting at the high levels. And he'd just been doing work on the pressure gradients over Tasmania and, and uh, apparently since 1983 and even since earlier than that, the pressure gradient over Tasmania has been steep, steepening from north to south. So it's higher pressure to the north, lower pressure to the south. And what does that mean? Uh, steeper gradient, it means stronger winds. So these are data uh, for, for wind speed from the only station that's at all, all, all useful, which is Hobart Airport, of the extreme wind speeds and their regression lines and lowest fits on that. But you can see that um, there's been a dramatic increase in um, the uh, in in the incidence of stronger winds um, in in Tasmania as a result of that. And if you have stronger winds, that means you have um, steeper temperature gradients because strong winds 
confuse the atmosphere, mix it all up, and you get the adiabatic lapse rate rather than the environmental lapse rate. So uh, the environmental lapse rate, things get cooler at a much lesser rate with, um, with altitude than otherwise. So the same amount of energy, if you've got the same amount of energy and stronger winds, you'll get colder temperatures in the mount, top of the mountains and warmer temperatures at the bottom of the mountains is what that was all about. Um, thank you, Manuel, for that. Um, and next to uh, finally, um, you know, this repeat pho photography stuff, which I really, really love. You can learn so much about what's going on from repeat photography. Um, this is returning, returning to the Feldmark and you know, that really pattern stuff that I started out with. And um, this is a photograph from 1973 repeated in 2016 on the top of Mount La Perouse. So you can see that we're Feldmark is just vegetation that's mainly rock. Um, so if you get rid of the rock, you get rid of Feldmark. But it does have interesting plants in the rocks, you know, interesting little herbs and stuff. So it's, it, is, it is different to the non Feldmark vegetation. So we do actually want to keep it. But in places in Tasmania, you can see non sorted stone steps um, and stripes that have been totally revegetated and, and have become fossil features in the landscape. And it looks pretty much as though it's only a matter of time on La Perouse that that's going to happen. But then again, we don't know what extreme events do. So it may be that these shrubs that we can see here that have grown over that quite long time period are going to be zapped by an extreme, extreme event that sets them back to a bare, sets it back to a bare pediment. Because some of our geomorphologists, the geomorphologists in De Pipwe have, have, have got evidence of those rock plates, you know, those large flat rocks you get on top of these mountains, actually taking off with strong winds and then impaling themselves in soils further down the slope. So you don't want to be up there during the strong winds. I have been up there once in a really strong wind and uh, it, was, um, it was entertaining. I mean, I could only get around by crawling, otherwise I would have been blown to the next mountain. So, I hope you've enjoyed my perambulation through, um, through cyclic succession or putative cyclic succession in the Tasmanian high country. And I've got a bit of a feeling of why it is so fascinating and globally, globally important. Um, and this last photograph here is um, of a violet lawn <laughs> in an alpine sand dune country, um, which has been molded by the wind. Um, so if you, if you want to contact me about any of these or get reprints or anything like that of any of the papers, that's my email address. Thank you very much for listening to me. Amy, thank you very much for that amazing talk. And I'm sure any of us who walk in those alpine areas of Tasmania or fly over them will now look at them with new eyes. I know I will be. And I now invite all our participants to type in a question to Jamie using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I have a couple of questions already for you, Jamie. One, who, one person who would like to know, Scottish friends have remarked on similarities between the Tasmanian Highlands and the Scottish Highlands. Do you think that's a valid comparison? I do, because the Scottish Highlands are, are very maritime for Europe. So the, the most similar mountains that uh, to the Tasmanian mountains in terms of the physiognomy of the vegetation and the sorts of landforms seem to be the Norwegian mountains, which are very highly maritime, and where you do actually get dwarf uh, dwarf birches uh, in those. Um, if they do have shrubs, and probably the Scottish Highlands and and the Irish Highlands, if there are any. I don't. I've never seen any literature on Irish Highlands, so I don't know. Thank you, Jamie. Very interesting. And another question, does geology exert any influence on the cyclic processes? For example, dolerite versus quartzite? Yeah, yes, it's <clears throat> the mudstone is um, the mudstone, the Parmena supergroup uh, mudstone facies is the is the most uh, most effective in um, in promoting non-sorted stone stripes. Um, the um, 
situation on the sort of the sort of features that you get if they're organic material like the ponds uh, and dams at Mount Field, um, they're basically independent of um, of substrate, so you get them on all sort of substrates. If they're deflation features or involve movement, uh, then you have to have a bit of soil to deflate. And the reason you get those interesting ones on the central plateau near Lake Ada is that it's a glaciofluvial outwash plain, and there's been a lot of dolerite that's been ground up and then been wind sorted. So it's been blown over the landscape to create reasonably deep soils. So it's indirectly related to glaciation rather than the substrate. But of course, you wouldn't get that on quartzite because it's almost impossible to chew it away. And yeah, it's very slow, very slow process to get those snaggletooth mountains. Mm. Thank you, Jamie. Our speaker last month talked about the use of drones for collecting scientific data. Have you tried using drones to collect any data? No, but they would have been good <laughs> if they were around in 1983. <laughs> um, I haven't used them. Yeah, they're really, really useful for, um, for really sensitive vegetation. So to collect data from really sensitive vegetation that you, you, you'd feel guilty about trampling all over. <laughs> yes, I imagine. Uh, a question, another question. Have you seen any evidence of alpine vegetation types moving upwards in Tasmania in response to climate change? Yeah, well, we can see, as you, as you could see in that uh, second last slide, the um, uh, shrubs are growing. And Jane Balmers, um, an alpine ecologist in the Pipwish, found the same with, uh, in the Southern Range, where she's gone back and re-photographed um, re areas that she visited in 1975 and uh, found that, you know, the growth of the shrubs has taken place. So um, as you get up higher, that doesn't seem to happen. They seem to be, you know, they try to grow and then they get zapped. <laughs> but down in the lower parts of the Alpine, they seem to be spreading. Not so much spreading, but the individuals are spreading rather than there being an invasion of new individuals. Mm, thank you. And have you noticed an increase in wind over the last 50 years? Yes, the data do show uh, an increase in the, the higher wind speeds. You can only really go on data because human experience is so, so sporadic and idiosyncratic. Like you don't tend to go up mountains if there's a really strong wind blowing or it's snowing, <laughs> unless you're a skier, of course. Mm. We have um, several more questions. We've got time for one or two more. Uh, how do you expect more frequent high winds and other extreme weather with climate change might affect the cyclic succession? Do you think perhaps the cyclic period may be sped up? Yeah, that's a really, that's a, that's a good inference. Yes, yes, um, it could be. Um, and yeah, like some of them, some of them, I don't know how sensitive some of them may be to uh, drying out of the atmosphere. If we get drying out of the atmosphere, that is in summer. So um, yeah, it's, um, it's very, very difficult to predict. As you can see with most of these processes there, they're multivariate processes involving more than just wind, they involve animals, they involve peat growth, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That's not much of an answer. I apologize for that. Oh. Thank you, Jamie. And a final question um, about the high mountain country. Are trees not present in this country because of altitude, or are there other reasons? Yeah, well, in Tasmania, we get large treeless areas um, in, below what's known as the climatic tree line. The climatic tree line is the limit to, is thought to be the limit to wood ripening uh, during summer. The temperatures, are, temperatures aren't warm enough to allow the ripening of wood and the growth of, of shrubs of tr into trees in summer. And um, Christian Kerner has got a complicated um, degree day formula for picking out where that is, where it's impossible for trees to grow. Um, so the true alpine is above that tree line. But here, there's no great difference between treeless subalpine and otherwise. And, and the wind and 
poor drainage and really shallow soils um, combine to make it really difficult for trees to get established in areas uh, below the climatic tree line. Thank you, Jamie, that's very interesting. And if any of our participants today have further things they'd like to ask Jamie, his email address is up on the screen now. And I'd now like to hand over to our Vice President, Professor Jocelyn McPhee, who is the Chair of our Honours Committee, and she'll propose a vote of thanks. Thank you, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, you're muted at the moment. We can discuss that later, Mary. <laughs> um, yes, so Jamie, you've just taken us on a, a really um, very entertaining and enlightening tour through uh, the high country in Tasmania and explained some of those complexities in a way only an expert can. And you've also mentioned a couple of times about the weather and uh, I can imagine just how bad it probably was for most of your data collecting and uh, quite apart from all the scientific achievements you probably should get a medal just for putting up with decades of bad weather. So uh, congratulations on winning the Clive Lord medal. I have absolutely no doubt that it's a, a well-deserved tribute to your career, um, career-long contribution to understanding the Tasmanian environment. Jamie, would you like to say a few words finally? Yeah, I'm mute now. No, I'm unmuted. I'd just like to say that I've been privileged uh, over the last 50 years of doing research by the wonderful people I've worked with um, in um, who probably amount to a couple of more than a couple of hundred people now that I've I've worked with in this country and the, their their company's been such a pleasure and um, their their work's been so so outstanding that um, yeah I I really I really really grateful to them. Oh. Thank you very much, Jamie. And I'd like to second Jocelyn's vote of thanks. I think it's very clear to everybody participating today why Jamie was a recipient of the Clive Lord Medal. And on your screen now, you have the Royal Society of Tasmania web address and our email address. If you have any feedback on this webinar, please feel free to email us. And if you'd like to find out more about the Royal Society of Tasmania, if you'd like to download a membership form, and I'd like to mention that membership is open to everybody with an interest in the advancement of knowledge. And if you'd like to check out our papers and proceedings, either downloading previous copies, which have all been digitised, I have to say it's, it's a mighty record of research, or if you'd like to consider sending us an article for inclusion, all of the guidelines are there on the website. And tomorrow I'll send you an email with the address of the Royal Society of Tasmania YouTube channel. That has all our previous webinars if you'd like to view some of those. And I noticed a couple of people joined us a few minutes into Jamie's talk. So if you'd like to um, see the beginning of Jamie's talk as well, the, uh, the video will be available in a few days time. And it's available free to the public. There's no charge at all for viewing. And you're very welcome to share that video with any people who you know might be interested in viewing it. In closing, I'd like to thank all of the people behind the scenes who worked to prepare and promote this webinar. To thank you all very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you participate. And we hope that you can join us for future events. Thank you very much.